Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the 2020 Mastery Mission. 20 topics, 20 guests for 20 minutes. We're here to unlock the tribal wisdom from the legends of textiles to help you get one step closer to mastery. I'm Simon Kutis and I'm joined by my co-host, Oli Kune. Welcome to the show, everyone. And we are absolutely honoured, privileged and delighted to welcome Mr. John Kaplan. John, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Good to see you. Happy New Year. And uh, thanks for having me on again. Absolutely amazing to have you back on the show, John. Absolute privilege for myself and for probably all of our um, our listeners as well. I'm going to try and make an introduction. You are a man that doesn't need an introduction, but you are currently the president managing partner at Force Management. But more importantly, you are an absolute legend within the game. You, you founded probably the most important uh, training company that's ever existed within within software sales and had a huge huge impact in so many organizations so many people you've you've transformed the way that tech sales is sold you know technology is sold on this planet and um you know it's just an honor as i said to, to have you on the show today we're talking about a really, really important topic, a topic that you're very, very passionate about. We've got 20 minutes. Please introduce your topic. Yeah, so um, I think a great topic for folks to consider is this, is the what it really takes to be effective in conducting a, a, a first meeting, whether it's a first call or a first meeting. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a really, really important topic because it's, it has changed so vastly over time of, uh, people's availability and how quickly you need to get to your value proposition. And, and so I, I just think it's one that is, uh, um, uh, highly relevant for people today. And I'm, um, I'm excited that you asked me to come on and talk about it. No, the pleasure is absolutely all ours, John. Um, so look, before we dive too deep into, you know, the, the inner workings of, of this subject, um, you know, when done well, what impact can this have on someone? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, when you're making a, you're basically making a first impression that hasn't changed for, you know, that's as old as Egypt, you know, first impressions are either can launch you into great success or can be very, very difficult to overcome. So you really want to make sure that the first impression that you make, you know, in a sales perspective is that, you know, you have the ability to understand something about somebody's business and you have the ability to take kind of an outside in approach uh, to where you're, you're going to learn as much as you can about that individual before you earn the right to make it all about yourself. And if you're not prepared to do that, um, and if you try to wing it, which many people do, I think, uh, you know, bad things will happen. Um, it's not whether or not some people say it's not whether or not you can get a first meeting. It's whether or not you'll be welcome back. It is really the measurement you should really start thinking about. I know a lot of people brag about, you know, I can get somebody on the phone or whatever. My metric was always, can you get them back on the phone? Um, so. I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to digging into that with you. So with regards to the topic, what, are, where do you start? So obviously the first meeting, you know, there's, there's so many things to consider. What, you know, take us to step one. I think step one's really all about preparation. Um, I like to say the difference between, uh, stress and pressure is preparedness. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's difficult to have a first call with somebody if you don't know them, if you don't know that much about them. But so you really got to get yourself prepared. And I think there's some easy ways that you can do that. Um, one of the things I like to think about is these, these things that, you know, I call them the three P's. Purpose, process, payoff. Purpose, process, payoff. And I kind of sit with that for a second. What's the purpose of my call? So I sit in the moment of truth for the person I'm trying to call or that I'm trying to, you know, get a meeting with. And I say, you know, they're going to be asking themselves that. So why is this person calling me? What's the purpose of the call? Second, is, 
What's the process? What am I going to do with them? What am I going to ask them to do? Do I need 20 minutes? Do I need 30 minutes? Do I need an hour? Do What do I need? Do I do people need to be in the room? Do they need to be prepared with data? Um, what process am I going to take somebody through? And the biggest one is the payoff. What's the benefit to the individual? What's the benefit to the individual? So what's in it for me? So if I'm thinking about the person that I'm calling or the person I'm trying to get a meeting with, when I reach out to them, they're going to go, why is this person calling me? Purpose. Second, what do they want from me? Process. Third is, what's in it for me to take this meeting? What's the benefit? What's the payoff? And I find like the people that just are prepared with minimally just that have a much better way to stand in the moment of truth, uh, stand in the moment and consider what the other person's reaction is going to be. And um, I think it's a really, really good way to kind of sort of, you know, get your mind right. Do you do you set that as an agenda at the beginning of this as well? Really good. You know, Ali, <clears throat> I ask this question all the time to people and I say, hey, do you send an agenda? And uh, I, I don't know what you guys would think the answer would be, but overwhelmingly, people do not send agendas on first call. Overwhelmingly. And I'm like, and I say to people and I'll say, why don't you send an agenda? And the, the answers are really... Uh, it's a bummer for me because I want people to have spirit. Like what we do matters. You got to believe what you do matters. And so you got to have confidence and conviction. And if you don't have that, then why should anybody else have confidence and conviction? So the number one answer, Ali, why people don't send agendas. Number one, when I ask them, it's because they don't want the customer to cancel the meeting. That's the number one reason why they don't send an agenda and so that kind of pains me a little bit. It says, if you believe that they're going to cancel the meeting because they get some memory that you're going to have a meeting with them, then we have a big, big gap to close. So yes, Ali, I am a huge, I am a huge favor of sending an agenda. So obviously we're touching on two different parts here, John. We're talking about a cold call, how you prepare for that. But also we're talking about how we prepare for something that's scheduled, whether that's a meeting or a, a Zoom call, which is obviously, you know, the new world or not so new world. But 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 yeah, you get my point. So kind of elaborate on what the similarities and what the difference are in, in those two. Yeah, I don't believe in cold calls. I, I, I don't believe any call, any call in the world should be cold. Uh, you know, I might be violating some other guests that you're going to have on or whatever, but I've always believed this. I've always I've thought about writing books because writing a book on this topic, because people always telling me, you know, hey, here's how to be better at cold calls. Uh, cold calls suck. Like, they're awful. And and we should never do a cold call. I remember my nephew um you know, calling me one time and saying, hey, Uncle John, uh, I just I got on the phone with the CIO and the CIO actually said to my nephew said, said I, I was just going to say his name. I don't want to I don't embarrass him. said, are you cold calling me? Are you cold calling me right now? And my nephew was like, yeah, I, I, I guess so. And she said, why would you cold call? You have you have you know nothing about me. You know nothing about my company. You know, like you have nothing better to do with your time. I certainly have more better things to do with my time and hung, hung up on the individual, hung up on my nephew. My nephew called me and said, Uncle John, I just messed up. Help me. You know, and I said, first of all, what was your answer to her question? And he said, well, what, what do you mean? What question? I said, what was your answer to a question about why are you cold calling her? And he said, really do not have a good answer for the question. And I said, that's where we need to start. Why in the world would you cold call her? So, so Simon, on a cold call, like for me, even if you know nothing, and it, it truly is what the definition of cold is, I like this principle of this, like this, um, this bullseye effect. And if you think about a bullseye, you have outer rings, you got some inner rings, and then you got a bullseye. I always think <clears throat> the outer rings are like the industry. Uh, and you should know something about the industry. You, you don't have to be cold about the industry. Take five minutes and look on the internet about what are some of the critical challenges going on in the industry. Then a natural state of progression of questioning is how are those industry pressures creating company pressures, the next inner ring? 
how are those company pressures creating departmental pressures and how are those departmental pressures creating individual pressure i think people are lazy today simon i don't i, I want to give people spirit i don't want to talk down at people and and uh, i'm not judging anybody but people cut corners and they go right to the middle of the bullseye and like are you having a good day how are things and they try to get personal with people and they haven't earned the right they try to go right to the bullseye and it's just not the way the world works. Nobody, nobody really reacts that way. You have to first demonstrate, you know, that you have some value and that you understand my business. You understand something about me. And that's what takes away the issue of being a cold versus a warm call. So sorry about that, Simon. I went on a, a little bit of a a little bit of a diatribe there. I'm big on this preparation piece. There are no cold calls. Make every call warm. And when you think about purpose, process, and payoff, in the payoff portion of what I'm talking about, the benefit to you, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, why you should potentially spend time with me is that based upon what I was reading in your company, we've done some business at XYZ. This is your chance to put like proof points in the conversation or where you've done something before to make it warm or you're calling because somebody else who knows them suggested that they call you. How you guys originally got introduced to me, do you remember? You guys reached out to me. You guys reached out to me the first time. I didn't know you, and I didn't respond to you. And I said, sorry, my schedule won't allow. You reached out to one of my dear friends, Mario, Mario Tyrone, and, and he called me and said, hey, John, some friends of mine are reaching out to you. Um, it, it would be awesome if you would, and any friend of Morrow's is a friend of mine. And that's a classic example of cold call to warm call. And I'm not saying you guys are being lazy or anything. It's just, that's an example of how immediately what, when it got warm, I was immediately open. So probably thanks, more than Mauro. you were looking for, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mauro. <laughs> I, I suppose there's a couple of really important points here, John, because your definition of a cold call is not not calling people out of the blue. That's not what a cold call is. It's about making sure that if you are going to call someone out of the blue, you have some sort of content or context or, or reason or purpose or knowledge to demonstrate it's not speculative. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that... Um... Minimally, people are, the, they're leery in the sense of, do you know anything about me? And do you have the ability to, is this going to be a pleasant experience? And, and I think that is the number one thing that you have to, de we call it the seller deficit disorder, actually. Seller deficit disorder states that people don't believe that sellers understand their business and they don't believe they're going to listen to them. They don't believe that sellers are going to listen to the customer. So we call it the seller deficit disorder. So I just go into every conversation, whether it's a first meeting, second meeting, third, knowing that I have to overcome the seller deficit disorder that is, you know, thousands of years old. Just before we move on to the execution part, are, are there any kind of things that we can kind of leverage, whether it's industry knowledge or common connections or references? Are there kind of some go-to that are a good starting point f to be able to warm up that conversation. I know you gave the bullseye analogy, but you know, are there some other kind of real go-tos? I mean, LinkedIn is a great one, right? So the bullseye one for me is the best one to get my mind right. Industry, company. What do I know about the industry? What do I know about the company? What do I know about the departmental impacts? What could be happening in the, in the person's personal impact? I'm kind of good to go if I get my mindset there. Secondly is, who do I know that knows these people? And I think LinkedIn and tools like that are just amazing for you to be able to make it warmer. Uh, I, I constantly am having first call conversations with, it's nice to meet you. Uh, it's kind of cool to know that we run in the same circles and somebody will say, well, well, what do you mean? And say, well, I see that, you know, I just checked LinkedIn really quick and, you know, we're connected to 70 of the same people. And I talk maybe about some, oh, you know, Susan, or, and that is a great way uh, to, to, so those kind of two things, the bullseye and just checking LinkedIn for me. I also go to the website, Simon, because this happened to me one time when somebody said, hey, why don't we start off this conversation 
What do you know about me? I had somebody do that. What do you know about me and my company? Now, I want you to just sit with that for a second. People listening to that right now, if the next call you're going to make and the person starts off with, why don't you take a few minutes and tell me what you know about me and my company? Holy smokes. Well, it actually happened to me. And I didn't know anything about the company or the, and the pay basically it was kind of like, well, so well, why are you calling me then? Am I supposed to educate you on all that? And there's an old saying that says, if it's been in print, I expect that you've read it. Wow. You should re everybody should remember that. If it's been in print, I expect that you've read it. Don't ask me about something you could have read on my website or done a Google search. It's offensive. So, so, John, take us to execution. Obviously, there's execution. Is it different cold call? Is it different first meeting? Are there basic tenets of execution which are fundamental? Take us there. Yeah, for me, I think execution, it's like kind of a golf swing. And I think about a golf swing is that you have a, you have a takeaway and you've got a delivery. And so I know that I have to have this motion in the execution of a, of a call. So I have to go and, and I like to have an outside in approach. And what that means is I need to first make it all about them before I earn the right to make it all about me. And that's what all the data says. Now, Interestingly, most people are put in a position in the first meeting of, tell me something about you. And so, or let me tell you about me. And they try to do a first meeting or a first impression talking about themselves first, which is for me, the, and, and the data tells you that's absolutely the wrong thing to do. But it's hard. How do I get the customer talking about them? How do I do that? Well, it's not as hard as you think. It's all really based around preparation of your discovery questions. And so what I mean by that is, and I write this down, <clears throat> there are three things that I need to take away from a customer every time I talk to them and additionally talk to them. But I'm trying to understand what their positive business outcomes are. What are they trying to achieve from a business perspective? What is technically required in order to get them there? What did I tell you? I said, there's two things I'm doing, attaching to big business issues and influencing decision criteria with my differentiation. The way that I do that is I ask discovery questions with the intent to understand the positive business outcomes, the required capabilities, and how they're going to measure success. And then I can pivot just like a golf swing. Those are the three things I'm going to take away. And in the conversation, whether it's the first conversation, second conversation, third, it doesn't matter. People say, well, can you do that all in a first meeting? Don't worry about time constraints. You have to do it all to get a customer to say that I want to buy your stuff is, is, is my theory, whether that takes you one meeting, 10 meetings or what have you. Then, I pivot. So the takeaway is about those three things. The pivot is, okay, let me tell you how I do that in my company. I heard you. Let me play it back to you. I heard you. Let me tell you how I do that. Let me tell you how I do that differently or better than anybody else and where I've done it before. And from the execution piece, I think that's really the, um, I think that's really a good little mantra. I call it the mantra that people can take away. And also in execution, I know this, Ali and, and Simon, I've got to get that customer to stand in their moment of pain. Because without pain, I've got nothing. We're not talking about anything. Without pain, there's no urgency. Without urgency, there's no money. Without money, there's no power and influence. And, and basically, nothing's happening without pain. So during my execution, I have to figure out how I'm going to ask great discovery questions to get a customer to stand in that moment of pain. Because what I do know, the more I tell them they have a problem, the more they're going to resist me. But the more I ask them great discovery questions that makes them stand in their moment of pain, they're going to convince themselves they have a problem. And I just, again, that's preparation, man. Like, that's not easy to do. You have to really be prepared to do it. And so that's the biggest part of execution for me. I'm leaving you bird speechless, man. <laughs> it's, 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 it's absolutely remarkable. I think one of the things that you're obviously talking about is that, you know, the, the moment of selling is actually, 
it's when you're actually getting them to speak, right? That's when you're really, really selling. And I think what you're saying is before I go and tell you anything, I really need to understand how I'm going to really position this and then paraphrase the thing. You're talking about paraphrasing. You're, you're talking about playing things back to them. Just tell us a little bit about that bit between I've heard the pain and before I tell you about the solution, let me tell you or what we, what we, how we can solve this. Let's just talk a little bit about. Well, the data that we talked about before that, Simon, is the seller deficit disorder says that people are going to come to conversations with you believing that you don't understand their business and that you didn't listen and you don't listen very well. So that's the seller deficit disorder that's existed for thousands of years, I believe, because as long as merchants and buyers and that kind of stuff have existed now, knowing that. Why wouldn't you prepare yourself to understand and demonstrate that you have the ability to understand their business and at the same time demonstrate? I call it the ultimate summation. So during a, a presentation, a sales call, a meeting or what have you, I constantly have this mantra in my head that says I have to summarize somewhere, whether it's in and I summarize every meeting. OK, Mr. And Mrs. Customer, what I heard you saying is. These are the positive business outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Customer says, yes, that's, that's what we talked about. And we also talked about these are the required technical required capabilities you said were important to get you there. And if I'm hearing myself say that, those better be favorable for me, right? And if they're not, I got more work to do. And the third thing is, here's how you said you were going to measure success. I actually write that down on a piece of paper before I go in. Positive business outcomes require capabilities and metrics, because if I can't summarize those, Simon, I can't flip it to the next thing. Well, let me tell you how we do that. Let me tell you how we do those required capabilities. Let me tell you how we do them differently or better, my differentiation. And let me tell you where we've done it before. So I think it's like the great kind of equalizer for a seller that wants to jump in and talk about their products and services. Why are you talking about your products and services right now? Based on what? What does that have to do with their positive business outcomes? What does that have to do with the technical required capabilities? And, and what proof do you have or examples? And I call it like the little enemy within. When I'm talking a lot of times, in my own mind, I have this little enemy within that says, why are you talking? I got this little inner voice that says, why are you talking? Sometimes it's so freaking loud, I answer myself, you know, and I look like a schizophrenic or something in front of people. But I, I, really, I really feel that deeply. And I ask myself, why are you talking? Sometimes I catch myself and I say, the reason I'm telling you this, Mr. And Mrs. Customer, is because you said. And if I can't, then I say, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Customer, I, we haven't, We've talked a lot about your technical requirements. Do you mind if I spend a little time asking you some questions about the business implications of those requirements? And it's just a great frame to keep me settled, to keep me confident, to keep sound uh, in front of somebody that regardless if I know them or don't know them. Does that make so sense? Point, yeah, absolutely. So at what point do you then start talking about the solution? Because you know, once I have that answered, once I have that answered, it's simple. If I have the positive business outcomes, the required capabilities and the metrics, I can flip to, okay, let me tell you about how my products and services do that. Let me tell you how we do it differently or better and where we've done it before. Now, what you're really referencing, Simon, I think, is when a customer says, you're asking discovery questions, they say, hey, why don't you take a minute and before we go too much deeper in your questions, I want to know, know more about your products and services. Everybody has experienced that. And I want you to just think about like Braveheart. Remember that movie Braveheart where Mel Gibson is like, hold, hold. Just because the customer said, tell me about your products and services does not mean you put your brochure in your mouth and your hair goes on fire. And now you can talk about your products and services. Sometimes you might not be ready. And I do this a lot. People say, could you just, Mr. Kaplan, can you tell me about your company and your products and services? And I normally do this. I promise you, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, I, I, I will talk to you specifically about our product, products and services. What I'd like to do is I'd like to do it in a way that's most relevant and pertinent 
to the problems or challenges that you're experiencing. So do you mind if I just ask you a few more questions and then I'll move towards telling you about my products and services and ways that solve some of those challenges. I'm 58 years old, Simon. I've never had anybody tell me, no, I don't want to do that. Never. Yeah. Do you, do you find in those answers to those questions that they're always what they're look? Sorry, what I'm trying to say is that the, the answers to the questions, do you always think, are they always what is the problem or what is the pain? Or do you think there's further question and then you they have to go deeper? Great question. So you have to be prepared with what you think those problems are going to be. And great companies out there, you need to arm your sellers with what are the typical problems or challenges? Ali, this is a really, really good question. And so I know I should be confident going into these meetings that these problems probably exist. So the challenge is not whether or not those problems exist. The challenge is how do I get that person to tell me those problems exist? So that's really the question, Ali, and I think it's a really, really good one that you're asking here. A lot of times I like to just take the pressure off people and just tell them, hey, start with the positive because people are like, how am I going to get people to tell me about negative things? Well, it's interesting what the data says. If you start with the positive, let's say it's a customer that's trying to get data from point A to point B, and you know it's a problem. They can't do it very well, and it causes tremendous challenges. And even though we know that that problem exists, we struggle with asking questions like, well, how big of a problem is that? The reason is because people go personal. Well, how bad does your life suck? Like, you know, that must really suck for you. And they, they miss it like that, like I talked about in that bullseye. They try to cut a corner and go personal. Don't do that. Those problems exist with or without you. A lot of times just to take the pressure off, what I'll say is, what do you like most about your ability to get the data from point A to point B? When I ask them what they like most, most about the, when, when I know there's problems there, when I ask them about what they like most about that, Ali, they wind up telling me what they like least. Right. Check it out. Ask your listeners to try that. Start with the positive. What do they like most? You guys recruit for a living. What do you like most about your, uh, your retention program that you have right now? They're going to tell you what they like most about it in the beginning, and then they're going to quickly go to, yeah, but we're really struggling with this. Yeah. And I think it's just take the pressure off. Motivation. Yeah. We talk about motivations and pains and finding the balance between motivations and yeah. pains. Because both create a need, right? You can equally create a need from a pain or a motivation, which is... Which you got is it. You got um, it. So I, I suppose, you know, you've got to the point where um, we've had a really good discovery. You know, I'm probably aware of some of the challenges. I've been able to successfully get you to, to get those out. Um, I've been able to kind of show that I've listened. I've got to the point now where um, I can provide some value. What am I closing on? Am I closing on a meeting? Am I closing on a next step? What, what is the close? Well, yeah, it's such a great, you have to be prepared with that. You got to ask yourself before you go in, what's a great outcome look like for me? What's a great outcome look like for this customer? And a lot of times I'll begin a meeting. By the way, I'll open up a meeting and ask a customer, what's a great outcome for you? If I send an agenda, that's the first thing that I'll send in the email is, I'd like to know, here's an agenda that I'm proposing. What's a great outcome look like for you for this conversation? I think it's just professional. It's a way to get people's minds right. So when I'm closing, if I've got that outcome, Simon, I'm ready to close. And when I said closing, there's no magic here. What was I closing for? I want a meeting with the economic buyer. I want to really try to close to say, this is the decision criteria that we're going to use going forward. I wanted to establish a connection between the technical requirements and the line of business, the business problem. I'm read whatever that is, I'm closing for something. So there's no magic box here that says close for this no what is it and if you're a follower of your content you know the content you've been promoting of medic and medpick like that'll tell you a lot of times what's missing in your sales campaign what else is left for what do you need so i always ask for something a lot of times i'll ask the reps what's your ask here at the end of the call what's your ask 
And I just make sure that I'm ready to do that. And a lot of times other asks come up in that meeting, and, but I, so I close for them. It's not like I'm closing for an order. Well, if I haven't established the positive business outcomes, required capabilities and metrics, and I try to ask somebody for an order, even if they gave me the order and I haven't established you know, what, we're, what it's really capable of, then that could just be a one and done sale. So I guess my point is you're closing for whatever you prepared for would be a great outcome for you at the end of a meeting. Where do you think some of the big common mistakes are when it comes to closing, John? Well, one of the things is I think people close uh, without really, with maybe the customer not being ready to close. And let me give you an example. Um, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, heck, I had a plan. And like Mike Tyson says, everybody's got a plan until the dude hits you in the face. Um, you know, <laughs> I hate to be so graphic like that, but once you get into a conversation with somebody, the the plan starts to, you know, shift a little bit. Well, just to make sure I always stay grounded, what I like to do, Ali, is I like to ask the question, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you would have expected me to ask you about? Is there anything that I didn't ask you about that you would have expected me to, or along those lines? I've always gotten great feedback from that from customers, and a lot of times people will just say, no, um, I, that the conversation was really thorough. I enjoyed it, but thank you for asking. Other times I've had people say, well, you know, it's, I'm glad you asked that because we didn't talk about this. Or I have no idea how much you cost. Or, but it helps me get really on their mind. It helps me really find out what's on their mind at the end of this conversation. So I know that if I have to talk more about pricing, I have to talk more about maybe some of our proof points, I have to talk more about, you know, how we do something or what have you, it's a great way to keep a customer engaged and very professionally kind of tie it off in the close. Make sense? Absolutely. Do, do you avoid the, the, the pricing questions at, at that stage? No, I, I always tell myself and others, people need to know if it's bigger than a bed, bread basket. Um, and so I'm always prepared to give a range of pricing. People say, well, it depends, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they start to look like, oh, my God, this thing's complicated if it depends so much. Um, I tell people, uh, you know, it's, in our pricing, there's, you know, multiple inputs that have to take place or what have you. But I'm always ready for a range. Why? And by the way, I'll give typically the high range. And why am I given the high range? I want to get a reaction to that. Somebody says, well, that's ab there's absolutely no way that we can spend that. Now, hang on. Ali, if we just did, discovered all the negative consequences around a problem, and the problem is so big, and I just gave them a price that is X, but the problem is 10X, I've got the ability to come back to the customer and say, well, how does that relate? How do you spend money to solve a 10X problem? But it, it helps me understand. So I'm never shy with pricing, but I don't just throw out a price and, and then tell the customer that's the price. Because you and I both know whatever you're buying personally, when you show up and it's not the price you said it was going to be, that's a problem. So I don't shy away from it, I, but I give, <laughs> depends on if I'm ready, if I know exactly what configuration is, I give them the price. Most times in a first call, I don't know what the configuration is going to be, but I'm afraid to give them a range. Right, nice. John. Uh, this so we're at the point on the uh, on the on the podcast where we want you to maybe perhaps give some a summary or some kind of key try these. So if you could just kind of share, absolutely, these are the things to try. Take it away. Yeah. So I guess a summary would be, you know, what we talked about was the difference between stress and pressure is preparedness, and I I talked to you about being prepared. And, and the, you know, the greatest way to be prepared, I think, is really just to think about, you know, how you're going to open a call and then how you're going to execute a call and how you're going to close a call. And the three P's, the purpose, process, payoff, I think is a really great way to really start thinking about the purpose of your call, what you want them to do and what's in it for them. 
and then really thinking about the mantra during the execution. I have to build this mantra of positive business outcomes, required capabilities and metrics, which is all about them. And then I have to demonstrate that I heard them and that I provided value with how we do it. Now I can talk about me, how we do it, how we do it differently or better and where we've done it before. That's what I'm doing through my course of discovery. And then in the end, I'm just prepared to ask for something. I'm closing for something and I'm checking with them to make sure that there's nothing that we didn't talk about that we should have talked about. I think those are kind of three great takeaways to have great first contact with people. Absolutely. I think that's an absolutely um, spectacular summary, uh, John. And uh, I suppose it's been an absolute pleasure and honor, a privilege for you to really come back on the show with us. And Absolutely, share, man. <laughs> share Absolutely. your wisdom, share your knowledge and uh, just inspire. And that's, uh, that's what you get. A bit of John Kaplan magic. Absolutely sensational I enjoyed stuff. it. I enjoyed it, fellas. Thanks for having me on again. Uh, it's absolutely our pleasure. Really humble to have you again on the show, John. And um, yeah, to all our viewers, listeners, we've hoped you've enjoyed this session. If you've liked what you've heard, please share and subscribe. But a massive thank you to John Kaplan for joining us today. We really look forward to welcoming you back for another Mastery Mission and session soon. Thanks for joining us.